So I'm Foodcom from Polytechnic in Montreal, and it's my honor to introduce to you our second keynote speaker, Dinah Magnet from Google. Dinah has been release engineering for more than 20 years. She shaped all kind of Unix-based software. She contributed to a lot of tech magazine around release engineering, and she's currently chairing a couple of events around release engineering. So she will be sharing with us today her 10 commandments on release engineering. So please join me to welcome Dinah. So I have, my background is I am um, have a master's in mechanical engineering from MIT. I, somewhere along the way, I discovered system administration. That was my passion for years and years. And then I discovered release engineering. And so I'm, I'm lucky, actually, to be, be on my second career uh, and uh, very, very delighted to be part of this workshop today. So, um, you know, one of the questions is, you know, what is release engineering? And uh, I've defined release engineering as accelerating the path from development to operations. And, you know, that's really what our goal is and what, what our role is in our organizations and in the industry. Uh, I've given this talk twice before. Uh, the first time was four years ago at the Usenix Lisa conference. And I targeted it to system administrators. And basically, uh, uh, the, 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 the message was, here's what you as system administrators need to be asking the people delivering software to you. Here are the commandments you need to ask them to live by. And then I gave it again last year to a, a test automation group. And there again, the message was, as testers, this is what you need to be asking the people delivering software to you. And so I'm actually excited to be able to give this talk to release engineers. And I'm going to be interested in your feedback on, you know, I think each of us could get up here and there'll be some overlap in our commandments, but they will be different commandments. I mean, we could probably have 100 commandments that we think uh, we need to be living by. So I'm really going to be interested in your all's feedback. And there should be time for discussion at the end of my talk. So I, you know, this is my talk, so we get to talk about my commandments. And it's based on my years of 20-plus uh, experience in developing uh, commercial software. And you know, these concepts are not just for uh, web apps or uh, customer-facing software. It's also, uh, you know, in a company like Google, we have, I work mostly with internal customers. Almost nothing I work on is external facing because I work in our infrastructure organization. So there's lots of different types of product delivery and lots of different types of customers. But I think these commandments are applicable regardless of what your deployment method or your customers. And of course, the gratuitous, you know, these are my ideas, not Google's. So, you know, all of us, I mean, we're release engineers, right? And so Release processes are very often an afterthought. Uh, organizations do them because they have to or because they've run into problems. And they're like, gee, you know, if we had some process in place, we could fix this. Uh, it's been rare. Uh, I think I've only gone into one company where I was hired on early on as a release engineer. It was often very much, you know, much further down the path. There was a lot of rework that had to be done to put processes in place. Uh, you know, most, most systems and companies do just the minimum to get it done. You're so focused, uh, so developer-oriented and code-oriented that the processes themselves, uh, you know, they're afterthoughts. They're like, what do we have to do to get this delivered instead of stepping back and saying, you know, how can we do this better and how can we use this to actually help our whole development environment? Uh, and, and there's often a disconnect, and I, I think we actually saw this in an earlier talk, where you know, the person who writes the code, the person who tests it, and the person who installs it uh, aren't communicating end to end. I, I think there was one organization where actually with SREs, I think it was at Facebook, sit in with the developers. And so they have very tightly coupled communication. And then other organizations, it may be you know, they don't talk to each other, and there's, there's go-betweens. And so, I mean, this is a release process. It's pretty simple, right? You check out your code, you compile it, you test it, and you release it. We're done, right? Well, oops. 
you know, it, it looks more like this, right? We've got unit tests, we've got packaging, we've got system tests, we're going to canary, we've got more system tests, we've got bug fixes that feed back into it and cause us to start all over again, and we deploy it. Well, I, you know, this is what I, <laughs> the responses is really look like. They're very complicated. You've got build artifacts, you've got reports, you've got, you know, all your tests, and you really need to understand what's happening end to end and be able to make the decision like somebody was talking about earlier. You know, do we want to release this? Is this a good change? What information do I have in order to be able to make that decision? And so this is, this is what makes our job so interesting. It's, it's really trying to solve. This is one of the problems we're trying to solve. So here's my first commandment. Thou shalt use a source code control system. Uh, we've come a long way with source code control systems. I mean, I, I, I've used SCCS and RCS and, you know, the whole gamut of, of Unix-based source code systems. And, you know, thank goodness we have things like Git now. Uh, you know, I thought CVS was so much better, right? And then SVN, oh my God, this is so much better than CVS. And now we have Git. And, you know, I can't see what, what can't wait to see what's coming next. Uh, and so it's, we must use a source code repository system. Well, what do we use it for? Uh, everything you need to release should be under some kind of source code management. This includes, you know, your source files. This is the obvious thing. This is the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about source code management, right, is um, our code, our C files, our, our, our Java files. Uh, the build files associated with building the software, uh, our build tools themselves, because um, uh, the build tools are going to change as the environment changes, right? And so you need to be tracking that. Uh, documentation even. Uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna rev your documentation with specific releases if you have customer documentation. Uh, and it doesn't matter which one you use, you know, just use something. Um, and related to this, and one of the motivations is you want to have a reproducible build environment. Uh, one of my first, very first experiences with release management, release engineering, I was actually a release manager at Tivoli back in the early days. And my job was to kind of work with the, I was a professional services person, but we didn't have any customers. So it's like, well, while we're waiting to have some customers, why don't you perform this role? And we had a release that we could not reproduce. We didn't have the build tools in place that we could actually go back to our source code repository and rebuild what we had shipped to our customers. And so that was a lesson I took away with me from many years ago, is you want to be able to reproduce what you were shipping to your customers. You want to be able to uh, go back and patch it. You want to be able to support it. Uh, you don't want to be in a position where you're forced to roll forward because you can't support what they have. Um, so you know you, the operating system. If you're if you're if you're web-based or or doing uh, managed hosting, you, you you've got to and, and even even your build environment. You want to be able to reproduce your build environment, and part of that's the operating system. Your compilers, your build tools, everything needs to be the whole environment needs to be recreated. And maybe not all of these things are in your source code management system, but maybe you have configuration files that are in the source code management system so that you can actually get a manifest of everything that's needed and all the dependencies uh, in order to reproduce your build environment. Lots of solutions, you know, you can have backups of your environments, you can have installation servers, you can have virtual machines. Uh, and so these are all solutions that may not necessarily be checked into your source code repository, but you need to be thinking about. Um, you know, tied into this configuration management, and I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with configuration management and release engineering over the next few years. Uh, configuration management as a discipline has been around much longer, but I think these two disciplines are actually going to emerge and evolve together because I, I don't see how you could separate them. And so related to configuration management, you know, binary dependencies, your configuration files, manifests, change list, machines configura configurations, uh, every, everywhere from your, your dev environment to your testing environment to your deployment environment. You need to be able to understand what they are so that you can troubleshoot problems.
Okay, but what about binaries? Okay, my personal opinion <laughs> is that binaries don't belong in an SCM. However, <laughs> uh, that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, we certainly at, at Google, we have lots of binaries in our uh, 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 source code repositories. But uh, I think I think it's important to be able to recreate those binaries, and, and I like to focus on everything that's needed to actually create those binaries. And if you can do that and it's reproducible, then why do you need to store the binaries? But you know, if, if you have to, put them in a separate repository. Uh, a source code repository a lot is really, most of them are text-based. They assume text, and so something like diffing on a binary file may, isn't necessarily as meaningful as <laughs> John's agreeing with me. Um, OK, so the moral of this is reproducibility is a virtue. You want to be able to reproduce what you have. That doesn't mean you can necessarily support what you have out in the field, maybe. Maybe, maybe there's a patch and the only solution is, there's a bug and the only solution is to roll forward. But at least you understand that and you understand why the reason is, as opposed to, oh, gee, we can't recreate that. Uh, let's push out a new version real quick. So the second commandment is, thou shalt use the right tools for the job. Uh, you know, just because you know a programming language doesn't mean it's the right tool for the job. You know, as software engineers, we, we should be using the right tool and choosing the right tool. I mean, in Google, Go is the new hotness. Uh, and it's fun to use Go, uh, and there's, there's a lot of powerful things you can do with Go. That doesn't mean it's the right solution. Uh, and comp you know, complex projects, you're going to have multiple tools. You're not going to have just one tool. I mean, the days of just having make, thank goodness, are over. And we've got lots of different tools. And this is just a very small subset. And obviously, there's lots of uh, commercial products available and open source products available. But it, I think it's a given you're going to have a mix of, of tools. And, and when I'm talking about tools here, obviously, I'm talking about the low-level stuff. I'm talking about uh, your compilers, your um, interpreters, uh, everything that basically takes the bits and turns them into something that, the application, that can be run as an application. Um, yeah, I figure one of these days, you know, I'll be able to respond to ads looking for a make person because people will have these make files and nobody at their organization knows how to use make. Kind of like, you know, COBOL programmers in the 90s. People were looking for COBOL programmers uh, when, um, uh, yes, exactly, <laughs> Y2K was coming around. So, so I'm going to make my fortune writing make files someday. I hope not. Uh, so the moral here is, you know, unnecessary complexity is a sin. Uh, so just because you know how to use five different languages doesn't mean you have to use them all at once. Uh, but there again, uh, what we're doing is complex uh, by nature, by definition. So don't make it more complex than it really is. OK, the third commandment. This is one of my favorites. Thou shalt write portable and low maintenance build files. Um, the, um, someone talked about homogeneity earlier and said by definition they couldn't, that, that they were running heterogeneously on their uh, front end machines. And so if you plan to support multiple architectures and OSs up front, even if you never do, your job's going to be so much easier when you probably will down the road. Um, uh, so if you design this up front and think about it, you know, how do you do this? When you, when you have output for your compilers, do you want to put them? How do you want to structure your trees? How do you want to name them? How do you want to name your packages? I'm going to talk about packaging in a little bit. Uh, so this is something that you really, if you think about this up front, it will save you so much. How many people have run into this where you, you, you get down the road and you're like, Oh, gee. I mean, we're dealing with some of this in Google right now, too, in some areas. I, I think there's some people are lying. I think I saw three hands. Um, you know, centralized configuration files are, uh, can really save you a lot of time. Centralized uh, compiler flags, configuration files, uh, flags. And, and um, because I, mean, I worked at a startup company where it's like, oh, gee, we want to change that flag because we're supporting multi multiple architectures. 
And I'm like, no, I don't really don't want to edit all these all these build files. And so it's like, okay, time to have a centralized build file and make it configurable so that uh, uh, you don't have to go do that again. And um, one of the reasons you want to do this is uh, uh, I view part of my job is making the developer's job easy. Most developers really don't care about build files or packaging or anything like that. They really are, are they care about their code and their cool code and, and finishing it. And so there's a lot we can do through best practice. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but through best practices to setting up templates and telling them, you know, you know, and, and you could do it in the guys, I'm helping you. Well, you're really helping yourself because it means they're going to be doing things the way you want them to do instead of having to retrofit or have to go back later and try to convince them that maybe we want to deal with, build with some different build options because it's going to, it's going to work better in the production environment. And so uh, um, this is where I see as having a, a huge role in our organizations. Uh, you know, related to this is build IDs. And by the way we structure our build files and our, our build systems, we can have build IDs so that uh, our builds can be uniquely identified and reproduced. And this goes back to the earlier command of being able to reproduce what it is we have done. And you know, here's some examples. The big thing is you want to be able to identify what it is you have. Whether it's a binary, whether it's a Debian package, you know, what is this and where did it come from? Because if you can't answer that question, you're going to have problems being able uh, to provide support to your customers. Uh, you can also you know, embed them in binaries, right? I mean, everybody knows you, know, you type command-version, and you can find out what version it is. Uh, and that information needs to make it clear, based on your build system and the tools you're using, what that is, and uniquely identify it. So I have two morals for this commandment. Uh, measure twice, cut once. In other words, plan up front. Spend time working on templates and consistent build files. And then that way, uh, uh, you don't have to go back and rework later. And knowing your ancestry is a virgin. Where did you come, if you're a binary, where did you come from? Fourth commandment. Um, that this conference has really talked about this a lot. Um, that shall use a release process that's reproducible and unattended and automated. And this is kind of where CI comes in. Uh, you, 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 must, you should have a continuous build process. Even though you're not, you may, maybe you have a long release cycle because you're shipping a network appliance maybe. Uh, but being able, you know, there, there have been studies on uh, the sooner you detect a bug, the cheaper it is to fix that bug. And so if you have a CI process in place, you can identify bugs much, much sooner and fix them before they get too far down your release pipeline. So, so I think this is important regardless of what your deployment process is. And I actually don't talk a lot about continuous deployment in this talk because I think these core commandments apply regardless of your deployment uh, a process. And so, um, you know, there's lots of tools available. Uh, thank goodness. I mean, this wasn't true 10 years ago. And, um, well, I guess it was, I was using cruise control 10 years ago. Um, you know, and, or you could write your own. Or better yet, write plugins for the existing ones and, and, and open source them. Um, this is like one of my favorite topics is release engineering as a service. Uh, and I'm actually going to be doing a project on this within Google this year, this quarter. But um, developers should be able to operate in self-service mode. They should be able to do their own builds and decide when they're ready to deploy uh, what it is they have done. Uh, we should work with them on implementing and configuring tools and policies uh, to help them do that. We need to be defining what the best practices are. We need to have tools that help us implement those best practices. Uh, it's important to have workflows uh, that are reproducible 
and uh, predictable so that if one developer does a release, you get the same results as if another developer does them. So there shouldn't be any, any guesswork. You take the burden off of them, they click a button, and, uh, and it just happens. There again, you're offloading the things they don't like to do, but empowering them, which they very much do like. They like being in control of their code. They know their code better than we do. But there again, all through the release pipeline, you've got to have the tools in place to help people make the right decisions. And I, one of the lunch, pre-lunchtime talks was talking about that. How do you make these decisions and how do you have the data? And it's, it's a very, very hard problem. Uh, you know, and I think this is where release engineers can offer uh, significant value to the organizations. I know, I know within, I work in our technical infrastructure, and we save developers, you know, literally hundreds of hours of year because we can just tell them, oh, here, here's what you need to do. And they're like, oh, thank you. I don't have to worry about that now. And they're very appreciative, and it makes the organization as a whole much more productive. All right, my second favorite, well, actually, it's, it's, I guess it's tied with my favorite commandment. Thou shalt use a package manager. And, um, I love package managers. I don't know why, but uh, I've, 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 been, I've, I've worked with a lot of different package managers over the years and dealt with packaging problems. And there are many reasons why you want to use a package manager. You get auditing. Uh, you can find out exactly what is in a package. When you install a package on a machine, uh, depending on what package you're using, you get different auditing capabilities on uh, this binary. Where did this binary come from? What package is it associated with? Uh, you can, many package managers have hooks in place for doing uh, upgrades, installations, removals, and you can leverage that instead of, you know, writing your own. Uh, you can find out about who built the package, when was it built, uh, what code base did it come from, uh, you know. Uh, you get built-in version tracking and dependency checking. What are some of the other packages this package depends on before you install it? Uh, what versions of those packages were supported or not supported. Uh, manifest, what's in the package? And, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in using native package managers where possible. Of course, this is Google. We have our own package manager. Uh, we, 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 we tend to, because of our infrastructure and it's so complicated and so Google-centric, we tend to write a lot of our own tools. But we, we use uh, Debian packages. And we also use our proprietary uh, Midas package manager. And if you're interested in that, I did a talk on that at UCMS last June. Uh, but uh, you know, based on your, whatever operating system you have, you know, RPMs, Debian package, Solaris package manager, uh, uh, you know, it's okay to support all of those different package managers. So Tar is not a package manager. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. And, and you can place that with jar, you can, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a package matter. <laughs> and I don't think it's okay to tar up a bunch of files and put them in a package either, because now you lose the manifest capabilities and the ability to query the package. It's going to say, oh, I have this tar file. And you're like, okay, but what's in the tar file? Um, Okay, this is another um, commandment that I l learned the hard way. Uh, you need to think about your upgrade process before, I love when people nod, they're like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> before you release your first version, think about your upgrade process. How are you going to upgrade? Uh, can you upgrade in place? You know, if you have a running binary, how are you going to bring up the new job and shut down the old job? Do you have configuration files that may be customized by the customer that you need to save off and replace? Uh, you know, are there database schema issues? You're going to have to have an upgrade there. You've got to think about that before you do your first release. Otherwise, you can paint yourself into a corner and have problems doing your upgrade. And this also will help drive some of your packaging decisions on how and what you package into your package. So you have to think about, you know, are, do I have any pre-install commands I need to run? Do I have any post-install commands I need to run? Um, and a lot of the package managers have really good support for doing this, but only if you think about it and plan. 
And related to that, uh, you know, think down the road beyond just 1.0, right? You need to think about, okay, uh, can I roll back? What happens if we, particularly if you're uh, uh, running in a hosted environment? And um, I think somebody talked about that earlier, that they had a problem where they couldn't roll back. And um, you want to be able to roll back, and maybe rolling back means you roll forward, right? But basically you're like, okay, we have a problem, we have to fix it, how am I going to do that? Um, you know, if you're doing uh, things like Debian's and RPM's and so forth, they may, maybe they should be, and, and people are installing the packages themselves, they should be relocatable. I should, I should as a system administrator, I'm out, I should be able to decide where I want the package to go. Is anybody here shipping software directly to customers? There's a few hands. Beyond the mobile. I think, I think obviously the mobile is going directly to the customers. But, uh, so these are the kinds of things uh, you know, system administrators want to be able to do. Uh, so the you know, moral here is you know, not thinking ahead is a sin. Plan. And this is where us as release engineers can work with our site reliability engineers and our field service people and so forth on, on, on really thinking about this and finding out how are our customers using and installing our software. Um, you know, some of these you can see is this admin and me coming out. Uh, thou shalt provide a detailed log of what thou hast done. Uh, logging information is so important to understanding um, what uh, is going on. So when you do an installation, when you do a deinstall, there needs to be some kind of logging mechanism. That could be in a log file, it can be events that get sent out and picked up by a, an event manager. Um, you know, uh, uh, and related to packaging, uh, you know, I want to be able to unpack and inspect the packages too. I want to be able to, to install without doing anything. And, uh, and the logs are so critical for troubleshooting problems because if you don't know what's happened and the sequence of events, particularly if you have a very complicated um, uh, web-based application with lots of layers, you need to be able to understand the sequence of events that caused a particular problem to happen. Maybe, maybe you rolled out a new application, version of your application, but you don't, and something happened, but it was something in the infrastructure underneath that changed at the same time that caused the problem. Or well, unless you have a picture of that and there's logging capabilities of some kind, it's very, very difficult to troubleshoot. So canarying. Um, you know, you need to have canaries of some kind. I think canarying, uh, I run across it most often with um, uh, cloud-based applications, web-based applications. So, you know, everybody probably knows this, but I put it up anywhere. Anyway, you know, the, the term came from using domestic canaries in coal mines because the canaries would detect carbon, carbon monoxide buildup before the uh, coal miners would. And so they used, they sacrificed the poor canaries to save human lives. Uh, so this canarian refers to rolling out a, uh, to a small number of users. And I think Chuck talked about that in his talk about rolling out to 2% of users. Um, because, you know, I mean, this has been, uh, this has been true all my years of working with commercial software. Customers find problems we cannot find in house. Uh, even if you're dog fooding. Uh, and I think everybody dog foods. Uh, you know, certainly in Google, where you know, I look at my phone, and most of my apps have bones on them because they're dog food versions of the apps on my Android phone. And uh, but customers are always going to find corner cases and just environments that uh, just problems we cannot reproduce. So it's important to do canary rollouts to very very small number of users. Also, so if you, you know, if you have all the monitoring in place, you can start detecting abnormal changes in the patterns. And uh, I used to work on our uh, um, search front end push. And we did, we would, we, one job at each data center, we would roll out across the whole world. And we would start watching. And then we would bump the number up. 
and we would start watching the numbers to see if there were problems. And very often, we would detect uh, uh, trends and problems early on, could easily roll back, very small number of users were affected or noticed the problems. But we could not do that if we didn't canary because um, um, you know, the risk is just too high. We don't want to push a new version of Google search everywhere at once. That's just a bad idea. Even though we could, we could, but we're not going to do that. OK. So this goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Our, our job is to accelerate the path from dev to DevOps. We need to keep the big picture in mind. I think that is part of our job and value add to our companies, is we really need to be thinking about stepping back constantly. I mean, we, we, we have the fun job where we get to go down to the nuts and bolts, and we get to work with build files, and we get to you know uh, write code. Uh, but we also need to step back and look at the big picture and think about, OK, what are our processes? What are our best practices? What can we do to make things better? I, I love the presentation uh, this morning about AWS and the analysis on cost savings. That was great. And that's the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. And we can use to actually justify additional resources to our management. Because the bottom line is it's all about money, right? We're, 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 you know, we, we like making the world's information available. But, which is Google's uh, charter, but you know, we, we, we want to get paid for it. <laughs> and so um, uh, you know, management is all about numbers. And so I, I, just, I, I really enjoyed that and took that away. So, so keep in mind the big picture. And I think this uh, 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 venue is great for doing that because you're hearing, you know, we get so focused on what we're doing. And when you hear about, the, well, gee, they're just solving the same problem that we are. And then you can also say, oh, you know, I never thought about that. And so uh, it really helps us keep the big picture in mind. <laughs> we would never run anything out of our home directory, right? Because we're release engineers. And we, we know the right way to do this, right? We're, we're going to package. We're going to have our best practices. We're going to do it, right? No, everybody. I, I have cron jobs running out of stuff in my home directory, I must admit, auditing stuff I'm doing. Uh, but you know, we can actually lead the way and demonstrate, uh, because we're all probably involved with tool development of some kind. And so this is how you do this, and demonstrate to the other organizations that uh, if, if some are resistant, you know, it depends on how much clout you have uh, within your organization to do things like get best practices in place. And sometimes the best way to do that is from demonstration and showing, hey, you know, we went from release cycles this long to release cycles this long with higher quality. And so it's kind of hard to argue with the numbers. So, so keep these commandments in, line and, in mind and uh, apply them to yourself. <laughs> and so uh, before we get into questions, I have a uh, Shameless plug. Uh, it's a great year to be a release engine there. I am, I am so excited about everything that's going on. This summit has been awesome. Um, I've gotten to meet a lot of new people. Uh, in June, uh, Usenix is having their very first uh, summit on release engineering. I've been trying to talk them to do this in several years. I've been telling them this is a hot topic, and they finally let me do it. We got four times as many submissions as we actually could accept. It's going to be a great program. Uh, it's going to be in June in Philly. On June 19th, the day before, is going to be a summit on configuration management. And I'm on that program committee. And actually, the two programs are going to really work well together. So it's a great opportunity to meet again. And um, then, if that's not enough, it, first week in November, I think it is, uh, in Seattle, we're doing a co-located release engineering summit with Lisa. And I'm working with the program chair of Lisa. And there's actually, we're going to have it one day, same time as Lisa, uh, a summit. But there's also going to be sessions during Lisa that are going to be for release engineers. There's going to be tutorials. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I mean, the response has been, Usenix never seen a response like we've gotten for a first time summit. So this is a hot area. It's very exciting to be a release engineer right now. And just this is the first time I've unveiled this. This is the June program. 
I uh, just finalized it this week, and you all are the first ones actually you get to see it. And we've got a good cross section of industry, of types of talks, and uh, I hope to see you all there or in Seattle. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Dinah. Release, release engineers have to deal with people on other teams and manage lots of relationships. And uh, your commandments are mostly about technical issues. Yes. And uh, uh, a, a really big part of being a successful release engineer is managing relationships with all of the other teams who are stakeholders in what you're trying to release. Well, and I think that kind of goes under the umbrella of the big picture, right? The, well, the, the, that's uh, part of the big picture. You know, uh, our release, release engineers are also still engineers, and they have a tendency to put their nose into their work and not look up. So ex uh, calling this out explicitly, I think, is pretty important. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. My question is, um, could you provide some more clarification around using package management? Uh, because, I'd, I mean, I'd use that f to configure my build machine, of course. But is there a way that you would use it inside the, pro the build process itself that's not dependent on my Debian or, you know, that's not like RPM or brew or dpackage? Um. Well, it's all about, you know, taking bits and making them available, right? So it really depends on if you want to use a package as, a, okay, we actually use package as a interim storage for build artifacts in our build system. So because we have this highly available, very distributed package manager within Google, uh, there are build artifacts that we will store in one of our uh, NPMs just to make it available to be used down the pipeline. So depending on your infrastructure, a package repository, a YUM repository might be a good way to make uh, intermediate build artifacts available possibly, depending on what your environment is. So that's, that's one example, if I understand your question correctly, of doing that. Uh, go ahead. So you, so you think it's a, so you're, you're actually suggesting it's a good idea if they're local builds go, I mean, their local test goes green, but it needs to get in queue for some larger like integration build or test that they check it into some sort of, not code repository, but artifact package management? Probably, probably not because one of our best practices is um, we have our, our continuous integration system, which does tests every time there's a commit. But then when we actually do a build, we start with the repository itself, and we rerun those tests. I, th I think it's very, it's very useful in the cases where you do your, you run your build systems, uh, like on, uh, on some platforms where you don't want to necessarily integrate with source code. You don't want to put some source code client or whatever other pieces and bits of it. So what you can do, you can wrap your build framework into packages and deploy them as part of the OS or whatever deployment you do when you deploy your tools first on the platform. Yeah. So we do that for testing. Uh, so we have like some Python-based framework, and we wrap it into packages, and we deploy them. So we don't have, we, I mean, we do version them and everything, so don't get us wrong, but we don't have to use source code client and re get them from the source code repository with bits and pieces of framework what we use for the build system. Yeah, so my question is about uh, the commandment you had about portability and maintainability of build specs. You said you should have portable and maintainable build specs. Are To some extent, are these two qualities not uh, opposed? Like to raise portability, you have to also have to raise maintenance costs? Uh, Maybe you could riff a little on that. I, I think what, what I had in mind there was thinking about how you architect them and, and planning for flexibility, but so configurability, but uh, being able to make a single change and have it propagate throughout your whole system. And so that, that's where I was going, coming from on that. Does that answer your question? Uh, these are gr great commandments. Um, what are we doing to uh, ensure that we're 
basically training uh, people to know these commandments. The, uh, the biggest problem I have is I cannot find people out of school or people, new engineers, who like, would, could know those Ten Commandments. So I'm going to have to beat it into them one by one. Uh, right? and what? Okay, so here's, here's my prediction, because I went through this with system administration. I played an early role in the development of system administration as a discipline. Um, a lot of that and the reason we're seeing curriculums for system administration was actually the work of SAGE, the, the uh, USENIC special interest group. So I think organizations like RELANG, like USENICs, uh, we, we already have an end with some of the universities, right? And so I think we can collaborate and come up with the right curriculum. Um, lots of opportunities for people to give talks this year. Oh, I almost forgot. So, so uh, there's going to be IEEE publication on release engineering next year. The deadline is August 4th, 1st for that. Also, um, USENICs. Has, and by the way, I got permission to do the Usenix spiels ahead of time. So uh, Usenix has an excellent publication called Login. I have extra copies of the April Login up here. Uh, in anticipation of you as, they asked me to write an article on what is release engineering. Because, because, because it's like this elephant, right? I think, I think it's the analogy I used in the article, in fact. And so um, uh, we're looking for more submissions. On release engineering for this, there's the IEEE publication, which I plan on submitting something for. So I think there's going to be lots of opportunities. We're going to see possibly standards, well, stand good standards. <laughs> I've been around like standards for a long time, and you know, so I I think that, I think you're here. I think this is the start of it. Yeah, I mean, just to double a bit on that, uh, in our university, actually, we have a course that we just started. I think Bram is teaching that course on release engineering. And in July, coming July, we have a mini winter, uh, summer school that will be doing like a three days school on release engineering yeah. stuff. So I think we're pushing in that direction. I think we need to have some camps at Google. I think I've also, uh, I've also. Yeah? I think it'd be a great idea. If, uh, if we're all on the hook for recruiting, <laughs> so. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, it's on, it is on all of us, right? I mean, I have to go, for all of our companies, I'm sure, we're all on the hook for recruiting, right? So they drag me out to campuses, but I have a deck that I made for college campuses, like, like you say, like what is release engineering, to at least open their minds in their you know, junior and senior years that this is a track that, uh, that's available. So I think it's, it's kind of up to us when we go on our recruiting trips to make sure we have a, a deck or something we can give the the 20 minute pitch that gets them excited about it. Yeah, like I don't think anything I said today was earth shattering to this audience. But like I, I went over I went over to Netflix and, and did a dry run earlier this week and it was really great because the person I was giving it to he's like, "Oh yeah, that's a good one." And that's a good one. You know, I was able to get his first reaction and it's like sometimes just seeing it you know, all at once. And it's like, "Well, yeah, doesn't everybody do this?" And it's like, "Well, no, some people haven't thought about some of the points." And so so an observation, um, actually, I, I think the ideas that you all just threw out are great, but um, the open source community has been uh, actually really driving this cadence-based release process. Uh, we, we heard from Mozilla earlier and GNOME, and uh, you know one of the ways that uh, Google has been contributing to this problem is trying to get students in universities involved in the open source community really early with the Google Summer of Code program, which has um, some hundreds of participants every year. So the more that students in university are plugged in to release processes early, um, I think is a, a great opportunity for students to learn about uh, release practices and best practices. Well, with that, uh, let's give a hand to Dinah.